All right, uh, if we could open with prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this weekend in the life of our country on this Memorial Day weekend uh, when we remember the freedoms that we have in this country and we give you so many thanks for these freedoms. But with that, these freedoms, we also know that they uh, don't come free, that they have come through uh, so many sacrifices over the 244 years of our country of people uh, fighting so that we can have uh, these freedoms and uh, paying the ultimate cost of uh, their life for us. So help us never to take uh, uh, advantage of or take these freedoms for granted and what the cost was so that we can be free. We also know that this weekend can bring sad hearts to some people. And so for those who are feeling a sadness this weekend, we pray that your comfort and peace would be with them. There is another reason that uh, we have a Memorial Day uh, for today, a remembrance, and actually for every day of our lives as Christians, because every day can be a Memorial Day when we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us by dying on the cross to set us free from the bondage to sin and Satan and death. And so we pray that you would uh, help us never take advantage of or take for granted this spiritual freedom that we have as well. But we also know that that is not the end of the story for uh, you defeated death by rising on Easter and then going into heaven to prepare a place for us someday. So we thank you for this tremendous sacrificial love that you show, have shown us, that you show us every day, and we know you will show us into eternity. And now we thank you as always for your living word, and we ask for your blessing as we read it, as we talk about it, and as we study it, that this alive word may live in our hearts and in our faith. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Good to see everybody uh, once again. And today uh, we're going to uh, finish up the fruit of the spirit. Uh, we've done the first six and today we will do uh, the last three of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And let me get the slide up here. Okay, so faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And first of all, my, oops, sorry, here. And I believe, hold on just a second, please. Did somebody else is wanting to get in? Nope, okay. A definition of faithfulness or some other definitions at the top of your slide is fidelity, trustworthiness, truthfulness, honesty, one who is reliable in what is professed and promised to others. Uh, anybody else have a word or definition that is uh, useful to them regarding faithfulness? So as we've done- Possibly. In, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jim. Possibly a holiness. A holiness, yep. Okay. And when we think of holiness, uh, a, a definition of holiness is to be set aside or set apart for a purpose. And uh, certainly as we see uh, God's faithfulness to us, you know, he, uh, we see his holiness in, and he kind of set himself apart, obviously, from the other gods for us. And he asked us to do the same thing in being faithful to him. And we will see that as we uh, go on. So the first couple uh, slides, we're going to take a look at God's faithfulness. Because the Bible is full of this. And sometimes this might be a little surprise. We talk about, we know, you know, how, how can God be faithful? Uh, but the Bible is full of his faithfulness to us. So first of all, uh, passages from the Old Testament, and again, the book of Psalms, this is just a sampling of what is in Psalms. 
30, chapter 33. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Psalm 57. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. 111. The works of his hands are faithful and just. 117. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. 145. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. And 146. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. And 140 and Isaiah. The Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Before we uh, take a look at uh, the New Testament uh, passages, uh, any thoughts or comments about uh, your observations in these from the Old Testament? Dave? Yes. I get that uh, the Lord is faithful all the time, forever and ever. Yes, exactly. Beginning when? When the, the creation. Genesis. Exactly. Uh, let me get the right, uh, where is it? Right here. The maker of heaven and earth. And it's, uh, again, so often in the Old Testament, there's, there's two key events that the writers of the Old Testament point to primarily. One of them, well, let, let me backtrack. First of all, one of them is the crossing of the Red Sea, the Exodus. Uh, the second aspect of God's uh, uh, provision for the people and stuff, they go back to creation. And so we see that here as well. And then the Lamentations passage, the, the beautiful hymn that so many people love, Great is Your Faithfulness, uh, comes from Lamentations chapter 3. Some New Testament passages. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. 1 Thessalonians May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Second Thessalonians. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. First John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And Revelation. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Okay, um, your comments, observations about the Lord's faithfulness. Yeah, Bessie? Oh, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm sorry, speak a little louder. I said I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> you must have bumped something that brought your... I your, did. Your, okay. <laughs> I <clears throat> excuse me, I kind of like the word true. That's, I think, a good uh, synonym for faithful. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, we did the names of Jesus. And here's two names of Jesus right here, faithful and true. Uh, Dave, I like that in his faithfulness he will always strengthen and protect us okay 
right here, strengthen and protection. So the faithfulness of God is not just a demeanor or an attitude. What is it? It's part of his nature. It's what he is. It is. That's exactly right. And he just, I'm not sure how to ask, he just doesn't say, I am faithful. What does he do with that faithfulness? <clears throat> he acts on it. There we yeah. go. It's an active faithfulness. Just doesn't say, I'm faithful to you. That's fine. You guys go about your business now. How often in these passages didn't we see him acting? Just take a look at the, here it's from the New Testament. Okay, strengthen, protect, forgiveness, um, the strengthening, sanctifying, uh, guards us from temptation. If you go back, uh, he continued pr to provide for his uh, creation. He's chosen us. Uh, he's compassionate. Uh, and so we have the faithfulness of God being active. I like that he's called us into fellowship. I just thank him every day that he has called me to be his child. There we go. Now we're back to the identity again, aren't we? We are God's mm -hmm. children because of his active faithfulness to us. <laughs> And just to touch on <clears throat> this passage right here, uh, because this does come up sometimes, and some of you are aware of this, but you know, so often we use the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. And we think of that in terms of, uh, you know, think of today what we're going through, the people possibly having gone through uh, illness, losing a family member, and losing a job. And we go, what in the world? How much more can they bear? And uh, so we point to this verse, and that's not what this verse says. Uh, this verse does not say anything about those kinds of life's challenges. Uh, what this verse is talking about, God um, will help us when we, he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Now, sometimes they go hand in hand. I understand that. But this passage is not dealing with those kinds of things. It's dealing with temptation. And so I, I, the phrase I like uh, when we talk about the other challenges of life is, you know, God doesn't give us what we can handle. He helps us handle what we are given. And so that phrase helps me understand the, the other aspect uh, that it, that's different than what this verse is talking about. Dave? Yes, sir. Uh, temptation in itself is not a sin. Christ was tempted. It's only when we succumb to it. Thanks for the clarification, exactly. <clears throat> and actually, we will um, touch on that, if you can remember that thought, because that really uh, applies to the third aspect today we will talk about. I think, I think Luther's take on that was you can't keep uh, birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Okay, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, going back to the uh, uh, how you would define uh, faithfulness <clears throat> or, or faith, I guess, is, is I think what we started. Uh, I was just reminded of a, Diane has this daily Peanuts cartoons thing. She thinks I don't notice it. But the other day it was Snoopy hanging onto a tree in a... Uh, very stiff wind, and the caption was, sometimes faith is just hanging on. But and that's kind of what we need to do, remember sometimes is, is you know, it, it maybe doesn't make sense, it's, maybe it's a challenge, but just hang in there. And I completely agree with that, but I think we can take that one step further than just that, because um, I think there can be situations in life where we just may not be able to hang on anymore. 
And that's when we turn to right here, God's faithfulness, when he says, I will never let you go. I will never leave you nor forsake you. All those promises of God that when we just, you know, our hands are just slipping and slipping and slipping toward the end of that rope. Uh, I think it's that's when God reaches out and uh, grabs us when we can't. Does that make sense, Gary? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And what a story that just came to mind was, uh, you know, Peter, uh, when Jesus asked him to get out of the boat, right? You know, he was, his faith took him out. And uh, I commend Peter for doing that. And all of a sudden, he lost that. And what happened, uh, Jesus is the one that reached down and grabbed him and pulled him out. So we have that combination aspect here. But I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, now how about our faithfulness? And before we get into some of these other passages, uh, the Bible helps us to understand that uh, kind of our response. The Bible's definition of faithfulness from Hebrews chapter 11, first of all, verse 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And so, you know, faith is not figuring it out. And this uh, helps us to understand the difference between faith and knowledge. Okay, now when I think of knowledge, I think of, I got to get it up here. And if I don't get it up here in my brain, it's not valid. Faith does not rely on whether I can see it, whether I get it all figured out. It's being certain of what we do not see when we don't understand, when I don't get it, when this doesn't make sense. And I go, why? What's going on? And I don't see. Faith says, be certain of God's faithfulness to you when we don't get it. And so that is, that's a part of that. Now, underneath there, the rest of Hebrews 11, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Notice how that kind of ties up uh, with here, the first verse. And then the whole list, by faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses' parents, Moses, the Israelites, Jericho falling, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And so then Hebrews 11 gives us that example. Now, when you look at this whole list, what are some, a couple things that might pop into your head? Like Noah. Noah. Go ahead, Sue. Like Noah building the ark. Yep. I mean, that's faith to build a boat in the middle of a desert. Yep, exactly. Before we deal with their faith aspect, jump back, go back one step. What do we know about their lives? We had some people in this list that I would not add to this list, okay, from a human point of view. Think about all the shenanigans that went off with uh, Ab Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the conniving, the lying, and everything. Um, think of Samson and all the challenges he had in his life. Uh, how well do we know the story of David and all his sins? And so we have this list here. Uh, these were not pure, sinless saints. You know, they were uh, sinners just like uh, all of us and uh, really struggled in their sin. And yet Hebrews 11 draws on them as examples of this faith. By faith. And so that's a part of this big picture, again, that despite being um, sinners, we go back to God's faithfulness to them 
and how they responded. Because in the lives of all of these, the one thing they did not do was abandon God as their God when so many other uh, of the Israelites and other leaders and other prophets were abandoning their faith in God and turning to other gods. These people never did it despite who they were as everyday sinners. Comments about that definition or these uh, people's example. Okay, let's start looking at the passages. Uh, Psalm 40. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Proverbs 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Chapter 14. Do not, do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. 16. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. In Matthew 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Matthew 25, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Romans 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Colossians 1, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faithful and love that in the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, and that you have already heard about the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Third John, it gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. Dear friend, you are, faith, uh, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. Okay, there are three more, but before we go on, what are some thoughts about that you have about these passages? Regarding our faithfulness. What two directions does our faithfulness go towards? Dave, I'm not sure exactly which um, direction, but I, I know I was just kind of focusing on the connection like Marsha pointed out between faithfulness and truth and that they go hand in hand. And um, I was also thinking about this idea of our faith being in what um what was the previous on the previous page um that we are faith yeah there we go faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see and there you, again you see that truth and so our faithfulness is really only as strong as whatever it is we are putting our faith in so if our faith is in christ then it cannot fail good and so one aspect of faithfulness, and I was talking about the direction that you were, you were wondering about it, is towards God. Okay? That kind of faithfulness towards God. He's faithful to us, and our response to him is our faith to him. I like the fact that we know that God is faithful to us 
but in Romans 12 there, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful um, in prayer. Okay, so all of a sudden we are back to what? Daily living, right? Yes. And so that ties in now, if we take all, even the next step is, it's just not faithfulness towards God, all of a sudden, it's also faithfulness to other people. Uh, some examples here. Uh, this passage from Matthew, okay? He's, Jesus is directing the teachers of law and Pharisees, saying, Woe to you, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. Which direction is that faithfulness towards? That's towards the law. Yeah, they were following the law. Fantastic. So their faithfulness to God was tremendous based on their interpretation of it. And all of a sudden he turns it to them and says, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And this is directed towards people. And so the, the, uh, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were so intent on this and following the law to a T, they were forgetting people. And so Jesus points them now to people. And, he's, and then what the last sentence, he pulls it together so beautifully, you should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former. So do this, you know, practice your, your, uh, your, your rituals, bring the tenth of your spices because you're living out those commands of the Old Testament. But uh, here's where you are failing, and that is your faithfulness to other people. Uh, let me go down to Colossians. Well, this one ties in uh, right here. We have heard about your faith in Christ, Jesus, to God, towards God, and the love you have for all the saints. And so now it spreads out as well. And uh, let's see, 3 John 3. Okay, right here. Yes. Uh, come and tell, uh, greatly. Great joy to have some brothers come and tell you about your faithfulness to the truth, okay? And you brought up the truth. So here it is again, and how you continue to walk in that truth. We could say that's our faithfulness back towards God. But now, dear, verse 5, dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. And so there's that second direction as well. So, so Dave, I have a question. Before we said that God's faithfulness is in his nature, is faithfulness for us in our nature? Uh, I'm going to say no. That, and that's, that's kind of where my thinking is, because I look at these passages and I'm thinking our faithfulness kind of sounds like it's a decision a choice or the whole well the holy spirit working through us but it's not something that we just naturally come to because paul's saying hey i am thankful for your faithfulness it's not like hey i just expect you to be faithful but it's one of the fruits of the spirit and we have all those fruits right where did, and but where did they come from where did they initiate From the Spirit. Exactly. From the Holy Spirit during baptism. Exactly. Uh, if we go to Romans um, 6, uh, we were, and uh, well, it's a great theme of Paul, when we were dead in our sin, God saved us. Uh, he, Paul talks about that in relation to baptism. And so, the this uh, this fruit of the spirit that we've been spending time on, I think we talked a little bit about it in the in the first week. Is uh, we do not have that naturally uh, because we are naturally sinners. It takes something from 
without from outside of us to come into us to give us that new nature coming to faith in christ baptism that's when love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness that's when it all begins it starts with god this is our response to what god has done and so yeah if we uh so i'm glad you brought that up man that's always something we need to remind ourselves remember remind other people of it's, if they're saying well um you know it sounds like you're talking about good works here uh no we're not uh we're talking about responding to what god has already done for us I, th I think maybe we had that in our on our makeup at creation, but the moment Eve started to doubt, then it was lost. Yes. Yeah. I think also our um, our ability to do those things to be faith to live out the fruits of the spirit, faithfulness, joy, peace, and that is really um, as being made in the image of God. We are reflecting God, so it seems like at creation. You know, God has always been exactly all those things. And when he created us, we perfectly reflected those things back. And so in, the, in light of sin, we are a broken reflection of God. So he's not changed. Our reflection of him has changed. So I, th I, think, I feel like it's not that he made us to have all those attributes in and within ourselves, but rather he made us to be perfect reflections of him. And that's what's broken. Okay. I understand that perspective you're coming from. Yeah. David? Yes. Yeah, the uh, thing I picked up here on these, uh, that earlier passage of the Pharisees and how they responded, and I look at John 3, and the way I read that is the brothers, which were the Hebrews. And I think the strangers to you were the Gentiles. And they were faithful in what they were doing for the Gentiles. Okay. You see where I'm coming from? Yes. Yes, I am. And actually, I think uh, we will bring up the whole Gentile thing when we get to uh, self-control, actually. Then uh, there are three from Revelation. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. 13. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And 17, they will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. And so, uh, you know, again, Revelation was written to the uh, persecuted early church, uh, even to the point of death. Uh, many people uh, suffered and were martyred, and uh, Revelation was written to encourage them to to remain faithful uh, for the sake of salvation. Last thoughts about uh, faithfulness? Uh, Dave? Yes. I was just thinking too, you know, um, I, I agree with Ann's comments in that the fact that um, we are all broken and weak, so therefore, I mean, we can't be always strong in the fruits that, in the fruit that we have. And it, it's kind of, it's on a wave. I mean, there's days, we have good days, bad days, and there's days when we're like 100% faithful and other days we're really not. And I think that just applies to each of us and our weakness as sinners that God can hold fast to that, but we can't necessarily. So that can be really frustrating, that roller coaster, can't it? Well, yeah, I mean, look at we just fall every day. There's just something our sin trips us up and it's hard to 
but you know, the, the good side of that is, is um, like our, our saving faith, it, it just takes that of a mustard seed and we can still retain all the fruit, the fruit of the spirit, but yet, like, like you said, it's, it's a wave, it goes up and down. And in the midst of that roller coaster, that's why we always have to look to God's faithfulness to, to us as being true and always faithful. Absolutely. And even, you know, I was thinking too, with the pandemic and everything is upside down, I thought, I thought to myself, but God is faithful. I mean, is, is not the sun still coming up every day? Is not the sun setting? Are the birds still not singing? I mean, that is um, a complete sign of his faithfulness, even when things don't seem uh, quote unquote normal. And, you know, in the midst of the chaos, he is faithful and it's, and he has the order of each day. I'm, got, I'm glad you brought up that perspective. It just helps us all to keep that more, that bigger picture uh, beyond just the challenges we're living with today. You know, when you, we go outside and we, we focus on what you just talked about, yeah, that helps us to, to, uh, to go through and endure those days. I too came across a quote this week from uh, Corey Ten Boom, and she said, uh, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. So when we know God and, and what he's, he is true, he is sure there's nothing that he wavers on, then uh, we, we really don't have to be afraid. And Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? In the midst of our roller coaster. On the, yeah, on the subject of roller coasters, I, I like what Diane did in preschool when a kid would have a really bad day and, you know, maybe it was even so bad that uh, she had to write a note home to the parents or something. And then the kid will come to school the next day and be kind of nervous because he thinks, oh, he's really in trouble and Mrs. Tim is not going to like me and stuff. And she'll say, hey, today's a new day. Forget about yesterday and we're going to go forward and I love you and let's go have a good day. And, you know, that's what God does. Exactly. Uh, which direction, though, does the devil want us to continue to look? Backwards. Backwards, yep. And here's the great shoulder tapper. But do you remember when you did this? Do you remember when this person did this? And uh, he wants us to keep us locked in the past because that just beats us down. And uh, I, I appreciate that example and, and, uh, and Diane for doing that because that helps us as adults to see uh, we have to release that past uh, because of what God has done for us so that we can have that strength for today and, and hope for tomorrow. And then at the bottom of the slide, as we've done with the others, I'm not supposed to be just a container of faithfulness. I'm meant to be a conduit of faithfulness. Okay, uh, we'll go to the next one, gentleness. Uh, some definitions, um, mildness, meekness, being considerate, is not provoked to anger and does not take vengeance. Okay. God's gentleness, uh, four examples here. First Kings, after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. Zechariah, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Matthew quotes this passage for Je regarding Jesus. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And I didn't find a whole lot of other passages uh, looking for kind of God's gentleness, but these, uh, these four here really help us also to understand uh, this aspect of the nature of God. Um, 
So your thoughts about any of these four? I, I, I don't know if it has that much to do with gentleness, but you know, when I was particularly the first two, it reminds me that sometimes we're looking for God in the wrong place or in the wrong way. And, you know, I mean, certainly the Jews were not looking for the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. And, and I think we need to remind ourselves that, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it is that gentle whisper we're hearing someplace that is, is really God speaking to us and not the big loud and clang of, of, of life that's, that hits us all the time. Uh, you know, Gary, I have never thought about that uh, because, you know, there was just not the earthquake, but there was the wind and stuff. And I, I guess I had not looked at it from that perspective that God, you know, caused the earthquake and caused that wind for Elijah's sake, because maybe Elijah was thinking, well, first of all, this whole section here is Elijah's lament to God about, uh, you know, him running away from Jezebel and Ahab after all the miracles God had done through Elijah and for Elijah. She's out to get him. He runs to Mount Horeb. This is where this scene takes place. And so um, uh, Elijah is really lamenting what's uh, the condition of his life. And I'm wondering if he was looking, at, and I'm thinking out loud here, um, did God know that Elijah was wanting God to go back to Jezebel and Ahab and just zap them and get rid of them? and display that mighty power. And so God knows that about Elijah, or does he know that about, he does know that about Elijah. And so he provides these two, two or three great examples of his power to Elijah. And you see Elijah going, yeah, God, now use that and go get Jezebel. Uh, but the Lord was not in the fire. The Lord was not in the wind. And it is after this came the gentle whisper. Okay, I added on, Gary, to your thought. I don't know if that. No, that, that's, I mean, that's all part of it, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm curious now, where did, uh, when, okay, the, so verse 12, where does that fall chronologically? Is that before or after he, he built the altar? Well, the, the Baal prophets built their altar and couldn't get their God to do anything. And then he built his altar and, and then the fire consumed it and everything. Yeah, this is a, a, a reasonably long period of time after that story. Because, you know, this took place up in, uh, in, in the area of Israel. And Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. And so he had a long trek to get down to the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula where Mount Sinai was. So this takes, quite, takes place quite uh, uh, a number of days. And this was actually, um, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. Okay, and so this was even after uh, the, when Elijah says, uh, take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Uh, he was actually hoping he would die in his sleep. And all at once an angel came and touched him, get up and eat. He was strengthened, that's when he went to Mount Sinai. But he still has this lament to God when he says, I am the only one left. And God gently, through, through all of this story, reminds him that you're not the only one left, Elijah. There are 7,000 others waiting for you to come back to give them strength and to lead them in this battle. And so that's where this all falls in. So maybe he was looking for another altar zapping solution to the situation and God was saying, okay, this time we're going to deal with it a little differently. I, yeah, and I, this passage you pointed to, I had not thought about that in that kind of context, but maybe that is in there as well. 
kind of God's lesson to Elijah. It does seem like he's taking what our human expectation is and sort of turning it on its head. So our human expectation of power and strength and might might be the earthquake or the fire or a king um, in, all its, in all his glory. And he's turning those things on their head and saying that power exists in humility and power exists in gentleness, which is not um, something that as humans and prideful humans that we typically are going to, to realize and recognize power and gentleness. We usually equate that with more weakness. You said that a lot better than I did, Anne. Thank you. How do we respond? Our gentleness. Uh, first of all, four passages from Old Testament. Second Samuel, the king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ite, be gentle with young man Absalom for my sake. The king is uh, David. And, okay, and so this is when Absalom is trying to get rid of his father, David, because he wants to be king. And uh, this is uh, David's instructions to these three. Proverbs, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 25, a gentle tongue can break a bone. Jeremiah 11, because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it, for at that time he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. Comments about any of these four? And I think maybe all of us have either lived or tried this out and how this does work. And it does work with children sometimes when they are uh, just uh, kind of agitated and yelling and screaming. And how do we respond to that? And sometimes what helps bring them down is just a gentle response or a gentle answer kind of thing. Some from the New Testament, Galatians, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you are to spirit, you you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Ephesians, be be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Philippians, let your gentleness be evident to all. Colossians, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. First Timothy. Now the overseer must be not violent, but gentle. Six, but you, men of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And First Peter, we've talked about before, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Okay, what strikes you about these passages? We should show our gentleness, not just speak it, I guess. We're back our to, action should reflect our gentleness. Exactly, we're back to action, aren't we? We shouldn't just be going around preaching the law to people and saying, you know, you're you're doing wrong. God doesn't want you to do that. And you know, we sh we should be more respectful and and go about it in a more gentle way. Yes. The uh, Timothy passage, just a comment, has to do with, uh, you know, Timothy was kind of this uh, young up and coming uh, pastor. And so a lot of Timothy was written to uh, Paul giving him guidance and guidelines for him and for all uh, church leaders. And right here, this is a, in the midst of a long list of things about the overseer. And I just pulled this out because of the, uh, the gentleness. The uh, 
Peter, first Peter passage particularly uh, resonates with me because I have a uh, atheist claims he's an atheist relative who sometimes <laughs> comes up with some pretty miserable statements and uh, it's very difficult to respond with gentleness and respect but I think it's probably more uh, effective that way. Yes. Yeah. Now, you know, if, you, if all of a sudden you just have it and you respond otherwise, and then they can come back, right, and say, oh, yes. well, I thought you were this loving Christian, <laughs> right. and all of a sudden, you know, look how you're treating me. Right, right. The uh, latest example that I just saw from him was... Um, that can anyone give a chapter and verse as to when God actually intervened in a, a child being molested? You know, I mean, it's a non sequitur to begin with, but um, it's just so difficult to, to refrain from responding to that kind of thing. And responding with one simple Bible passage just doesn't work, does it? Because no. there are so many different facets and aspects to go that go into a question like that. Well, that's right. Yeah. You know, it's just a just not understanding at all the sinful human condition and uh, how God. And we we too ask the same question, right? Oh sure. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the the silliness of it is the fact that they they claim not to believe there is a God in the first place. So why should they be concerned whether or not he interferes in our life? And yeah. if you quoted a chapter and a verse to him anyway, they don't believe the Bible either. So what would be your outcome? Yeah. They would still wouldn't believe anything. Yeah. So by his question, he's actually acknowledging the presence of God. Exactly. Exactly. Which I've always contended, but... Yeah. He doesn't accept that. Yeah. Right. Right. Dave. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple thoughts here. That uh, First Kings passage. My interpretation was God was punishing those people by sending the earthquake and the fire. Elijah wanted to totally destroy the people, and here God says, "No, I punished them, and my forgiveness." And here, these other passages had to do but to be humble and gentle and to be forgiving. Yep, that's a that's a great addition to that passage. Or an, an additional thought. It occurred to me that the um, antithesis antithesis of all this uh, is if, if you look at like the, the Pharisees in Jesus' time, I mean, they were very quickly to point out your flaws, but they they weren't very gentle about it. Yes. Yeah. And then at the bottom, uh, we'll do it again. I'm not supposed to be just a container of gentleness. I'm meant to be a conduit of gentleness. And let's go on to the last aspect of the fruit of the spirit uh self-control and when we started this uh two weeks ago on the fruit of the spirit you know and we looked at the the list i asked you know which one of these nine uh, generally might people say they have the hardest living out and there were two that came up uh, one was patience uh, the other one was self-control and, uh, and that could well be for, for many people, is that those two are some of the, the challenges. A couple definitions of self-control, temperance, self-mastery, curbing the impulses of the flesh, in other words, excessive food, drink, enjoyment, etc. Mastering desires and love of pleasures. And a question I saw one time that helped uh, we understand the self-control idea is, am I in control of my pleasures or are my pleasures in control of me? And that's a, a pretty convicting question, but it certainly applies to us. And that's a part of that 
uh, introspection that we do in our lives as Christians every day. And as Marcia pointed out, it's, uh, it's like a roller coaster. And some days we're great at it, and other days uh, uh, we wonder, what, what in the world am I doing here? Any other thoughts about the, that question or the definition? All right, a uh, couple slides of passages. Uh, first of all, Proverbs 25. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. First Thessalonians. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. First Timothy 3, Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate and self-controlled. Second Timothy, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Okay, uh, before we go on to the next uh, slide, uh, any comments about these four? You know, uh, when Paul, Paul, Paul likes lists, and uh, here's an example of a long list of things that makes us raise our eyebrows, and with some of these, we, all of a sudden, it makes us uncomfortable because we see ourselves in a list like this somewhere. Uh, I think he hits on almost everybody, and within this list, uh, he mentions uh, self-control. And uh, kind of a definition of self-control is right here. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so that priority idea uh, enters here as well. So I'm wondering why did he qualify or put this in a list of things that you would see uh, in the last days when I'm sure all of this was going on at the time he wrote it. There's some uh, speculation that uh, uh, people who really, really dig into Paul's writings, that he, had, he may have felt that uh, he was either going to see the last day or it was going to be fairly quickly after uh, he died. And so uh, while we can see the last days we're now 2,000 years after Paul. Uh, we go, wow, this is this perfectly describes our, uh, you know, 2020 in some ways. Uh, I think Paul wrote this because this was going on in his lifetime as well, and he may have well felt that, uh, based on what Jesus said, you know, I'm I'm coming soon. I'm going to come in your lifetime too. Three from Titus. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. 
for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his own, very own, eager to do good. Now, one of the things that helps us and kind of with uh, the whole thing of Titus is that uh, Titus was a Gentile convert who worked with Paul. And because Paul spent so much of his time in Asia Minor that was controlled by the Greeks and Greek thought and Greek religion and stuff, it's quite possible that Titus was a, a Greek. And the Greeks were lovers of themselves and pleasures. It was all about me, myself, and I, and what, uh, what I can get out of this life. Uh, and uh, that's the culture that Titus came from. And so when he writes to Titus, who is now a convert, convert and working with Paul, we, we understand why he would use self-control so often in when he wrote this book uh, to Titus. And then uh, Peter as well. Uh, here's Peter 1, therefore prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled. Chapter 4, the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can, can pray. Chapter 5, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Second Peter, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Okay, um, thoughts about uh, Peter, what Peter said about it, and what Paul said to Titus about it. I've been kind of thinking about this concept of a couple things. One thing is this idea of self-control has the word self in it, which is, um, you know, a lot of the, well, all of these fruits of the spirit are sort of antithesis to, or stand against pride. They sort of stand in opposition to pride. And, you know, we saw that in many of the other ones, but here again, uh, when we are prideful, then we, I guess I'm sort of thinking about this as somebody who comes from a non- Christian standpoint could say, I am self-controlled because they don't recognize that something that they're doing, a behavior that they're doing needs to be controlled because it's within what they view as being self-controlled. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and, oh, go ahead. Well, I just, with, no. with that, the, the, the very last passage that you put, um, Dave, there, that Second Peter 1, 6, I think kind of brought that together for me because it made that list of self-control as being um, not just happening without knowledge and goodness and faith, which are you have to have knowledge of what you need to control in order to know that you need to control it. Okay, so uh, a person like you are describing what... It, where does their standard for living come from? Themselves. Exactly. And so I get to set the rules for what, how I live my life. And if I, according to my rules, do okay, then I'm living in self-control when it may be completely against what the standards that God sets. Right. So it, I guess we're with this particular fruit of the spirit, and maybe this is with all fruits of the spirit, is that they can't necessarily just be isolated without the, without the presence of God and the spirit, obviously. I mean, this fruit of this is, is a, this is self-control is driven by the spirit. So it's almost like you could say it's sort of like spirit control 
or a God control, we use the word self control because we're talking about our own behaviors and how those are reflected. But we're not being controlled by, you know, the sinful self. We're being we're we're submitting to the spirit. Yes, interesting. And you know, you talked about they aren't in isolation. And how often haven't we seen that the the nine aspects of the fruit? Uh, how often uh, Paul and here Peter? Well, right here. Uh, so here we have goodness, um, self-control, kindness, love. So within this uh, one passage from Peter, he brings together four of the nine uh, attributes of the spirit, of the fruit of the spirit, and uh, Paul does that too. And so, yeah, you're exactly right that. Uh, uh, these uh, these flow together. They uh, they support each other. And uh, when we kind of uh, are dealing with one in many aspects, we're dealing with another one or two at the same time. But kind of in other words, it's easy to believe you have self control when you're under the delusion that you're in control in the first place. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say concerning that uh, Titus passage um, that uh, when I get to be, yeah, Titus 2 verses 1 and 2, when I get to be an old man, I will uh, uh, have to remember to sign up for one of those classes. <laughs> you know, Dave, I go back to the Proverbs passage and then I think some of the other ones tie into that but so a wall was used for defense and and then you go to the first Peter where the lion is crawling the devil prowls around like a roaring lion sounds like self-control is almost a defense against all the slings and arrows of the world because if you don't have that self-control because once you let that let that breach in the wall happen, then anything can start coming in. So you need that self-control. Nice tie-in. Yes. Yeah, because you're not going to be able to avoid temptation very well if you don't have some degree of self-control. Dave, the, uh, Dave, you don't have to oh. say Dave, just talk. Dave? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, the Titus and the uh, Peter seem to have a similar uh, thing to say, which be, be prepared for the end time because you don't know when it's coming. Uh, yes, that struck me um, about Peter, you know, kind of uh, the question behind uh, ends with uh, Paul and uh you know, the whole thing of, yeah, where was it? Uh, oh, the end of all things is near. You know, it sounds like Paul. And so it could well be the Peter too, man. I'm, uh, I'm ready, Jesus, anytime. And I expect you to come. Yes, so, yeah, I Pete, thought that all of the apostles felt that the end times, I mean, that the end was coming very quickly because Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. Yeah, certainly John, yeah. And John related that at the end of Revelation. He says, John's kind of tired of all of this stuff. He said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And uh, certainly that might be a prayer of ours sometimes as well. Anytime, Jesus. But the other question I had, um, Dave, was the um, one in Tim Timothy. Uh, at the end there, it says... Uh, having a form of godliness but denying its power uh this having a form of godliness i don't understand what that means i think uh the form of godliness is i how do i put it okay after all of this you know i'm doing pretty good with this list and so therefore, I'm pretty godly. Um, 
or I know God is powerful, but I don't live like it. And so we deny it. Um, and I don't know, Carolyn, if that helps at all. I'm just thinking out loud again. Yeah, seems reasonable. Okay. <laughs> yeah, especially in the light of what um, uh, was it Anne said about um, thinking we're in control. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, the last uh, statement, I'm not supposed, again, I'm not supposed to be just a container of self-control. I'm meant to be a conduit of self-control. So that wraps up the fruit of the spirit uh, regarding uh, in the midst of life's challenges, God's provision for us. Um, Next week, there are some other things that uh, Paul brings up uh, that are certainly we uh, we could almost add to the the fruit to this list of the nine in the fruit of the spirit, and so we'll take a look at uh, two or three others that he does not list there that I think are certainly applicable as well. Uh, before we close, any last thoughts or comments? Okay, let's uh, close. Gracious Lord, we thank you uh, for this uh, hour, a little longer than an hour today that we could dig and talk and, and encourage and learn from each other as well with these uh, powerful passages. And as we've seen uh, in these passages again uh, today, the dichotomy of our lives. In other words, passages that so powerfully point out who we are as sinners in need of a savior, but then the passages that point so powerfully to who you are as a God who can, continues to love us despite who we are as sinners, a God who continues to come to us uh, to strengthen our faith, to provide for our daily living, and to help and encourage us in our lives. And so as we live up what and live with what you have given to us, help us to be that conduit so that others can see how you live in our lives and in our hearts as well. Uh, be with us and keep us in your care in this coming week. In your name, amen. Uh, God bless you all and uh, look forward to next week. Thank Thanks, you, Dave. Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Have a great week. You too, Bessie.